Royso, and welcome to this evening's event, the Royso Page Collection Life Through a Different Lens. This event is part of the Being Human Festival, which is taking place across the UK between the 12th and the 22nd of November. Being Human is the only national festival of the humanities run by the School of Advanced Study, University of London, in partnership with the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the British Academy. Due to circumstances we're facing this year, all of our Swansea events are online, as are most across the UK. We'll post a link to the full programme into the chat and details on how you can follow us on social media. The hashtag for this year's festival is Being Human 2020. At the end of tonight's event, we will include a link to a feedback survey in the chat. We would gr greatly appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to complete the survey. Your feedback is incredibly valuable to us. And um, please note that this event is being recorded. My name is Sean Williams and I'm head of special collections at Swansea University and I'm joined Anita Corbin, a photographer and long-term and good friend of Raisa Page, and David Johnston-Smith, who is currently researching and writing a book about Raisa Page, having previously worked as a project archivist at the Richard Burton Archives cataloguing the collection. The Raisa Page collection, which comprises over 2,000 prints, 35,000 negatives, 5,000 transparencies, books, correspondence, and other ephemera was deposited at the Richard Burton archives in 2014 by Adrian Jones, a close friend of Raisa. From the moment my former colleagues, Elizabeth Bennett and Sue Thomas saw the collection, they knew it was a very important and a very special collection. And I would like to thank Adrian for placing the collection in our care and for all her support and encouragement that she gives us as we seek to make this remarkable collection available for all to enjoy. This evening, we are delighted to introduce you to some of the highlights from this remarkable collection. And we are also delighted to launch our online exhibition, which features photographs that we will be looking at um, later in the evening, as well as um, others from the collection. We asked some historians, photographers, archivists and friends of Raisa to choose an image from the collection and write a response to it. And we will be looking at these shortly and inviting you, the audience, to use the chat function to provide your response. We really want this evening to be as interactive as possible. So we will also be using the polling function to ask you some questions, starting now. So get your fingers on the, on the button. Before this event, we'd like to know, had you heard of Raisa Page? And if you could all answer yes, no, or not sure. And we'll see. And there we are. Ah, oh, so interesting. 59, 58% had, 42% hadn't. So for those of you that 42% who are not familiar with Raisa's work, and also for those 58% who, who are, we want to provide some context for when we look at the photographs that Raisa took later on um, in this event. So I would like to invite David and Anita to introduce us to Raisa. We're going to start by with David, who has very kindly recorded a short presentation about the first 45 years of Raisa's life before she became a full time photographer. At the end of that presentation, Anita will then speak briefly about Raisa, the photographer. Raisa Page's photographic career extends from around 77, 78 until the very early 1990s and did not she did not begin this until she was in her mid forties. Um, it covers barely 15 years of a life which spanned nearly eight decades. Yet by recognizing her life experiences in the period before she took up a camera in earnest, 
we are aided in an understanding of how these experiences created the photographer of insight and power that she became. Cleone Alexandra Smilis, she did not become Raisa until the 1960s after a period in the Russian Orthodox faith, um, was born in Toronto in 1932 to a Greek Macedonian father and a mother of English descent. The family were, at least initially in Raisa's own words, wretchedly poor. The effect of this poverty on her early childhood stayed with Raisa all of her life. One long lasting memory was of a young boy dressed entirely in rags, arriving at her grandparents' house while her mother was cooking a tiny Sunday roast. In all honesty, itself probably taken from her father's workplace, a restaurant. Raisa's mother insisted that the young beggar was given sandwiches from this roast. And although she never had an easy relationship with her mother, this kind and positive memory stayed with her. Her father, Nick Smilis, proved himself a strong role model for the young Raisa. He was a radical and passionate about injustice, even organizing a successful strike of restaurant workers in Toronto, protesting about being forced to work seven day weeks. His luxury was a radio and she grew up listening to the BBC News along with the Russian news in English during the war. She recalled fundraising both for Stalingrad as well as selling lemonade on the streets during the Battle of Britain, the latter a story that even made the Toronto Daily Telegram. In a 1994 British Library oral history interview, Raisa, looking back, stated that she wouldn't describe my childhood as happy, but it was much more expansive than many today. The sense of physical freedom she felt was and remained absolutely crucial to her. When this was not permitted to others, that also had a strong emotional effect on her. Recalling a Gentiles only sign on Toronto's Cherry Beach and asking her father why, Nick replied, the world is wicked. Even as a young girl, Raisa was far from content with that wickedness. Photography played a part in this too. As a young teenager, she saw harrowing photographs of Belson in her father's life magazine. The reality that people were capable of such appalling inhumanity to each other had a deep impact on her psyche. Raisa's independent streak showed itself as she ran away from home at 16. She was returned, but history soon repeated itself. On her 18th birthday, she announced to her parents that she had joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. Here she trained as a meteorological observer. By 1953, her service complete, Raisa had saved enough money for a boat ticket to England, arriving with three five pound notes in savings. In 1954, after many adventures and at the age of 21, she received a message from her father to say he was returning to Greece for the first time since he had emigrated to Canada in the 1920s. Her three months in Greece proved immensely moving and had a lifelong effect on Raisa. With her father, Raisa went looking for a female cousin of her age, but discovered that she had been taken by the Nazis at around 13 as an enslaved sex worker and that she had eventually perished at the Mauthausen concentration camp. They discovered food parcels sent regularly from Canada had almost never got through. Nick's brother-in-law was so distrustful of these Canadian visitors that he was convinced they had only come in order to steal his meager and tiny parcel of land and he refused to see them. Another relative had, it turns out, forced his daughter into prostitution in order to get money for food. Both Nick and Raisa were traumatized by the trip. In 1994, Raisa describes her sense of cosmic guilt about her Greek family suffering. No noticeably, she also stated that she wished I'd had a camera, but we didn't have one. After becoming very ill with pneumonia, Raisa returned to Canada to recuperate. There, whilst working as a life model in Vancouver, she met Robin Page, later an artist and academic of some renown. They married and their daughter Rachel was born in 1956. 
The relationship was never a stable one, though, and Raisa, after moving to England originally to be with Robin, found herself alone and needing to support both herself and her young daughter. She obtained employment at the Bernard Leach Pottery Shop in St. Ives. Um, and interestingly, a large leech plate was later sold by Raisa to help finance her entry into professional photography. After a year, she returned to London where after several short-term jobs, she settled on work as an assistant to a private investigator, John Walsh from Putney. This varied work included taking photographs with a concealed camera housed in an underarm briefcase. So in a slightly peculiar way, this was the first time she actually made an income from photography. Raisa stated that although the odd job was potentially dangerous, she was never asked to do anything strictly illegal. At some point in the early 1960s, now in her late 20s, Raisa met a lecturer from Liverpool University. Raisa was telling her about observing a child shoplifting and going to talk to the child rather than reporting them. The suggestion was made to Raisa that she might want to consider a career in childcare. Realizing the potential that this carried in providing a stable income for her and Rachel, Raisa did just that. From 1962, for 16 years or so, Raisa had a very challenging yet fulfilling and successful career in social work, specializing in the area of adoption and fostering. She rose from being a childcare assistant for the London County Council at King's Cross after studying to become a professionally qualified social worker at Polytechnic in London. She was eventually appointed as a senior childcare officer in several London boroughs and then later as the assistant director of the Association of British Adoption Agencies. Her final role was as a senior development officer at the National Children's Bureau under renowned psychologist Mia Kelmer Pringle. Here's some of her most high profile work took place, including the Who Cares project, which aimed to give a voice to all of the many children in care within the UK. In an obituary written after Raisa's death in 2011 for the Therapeutic Care Journal, a former colleague, Ros Nesbitt, wrote in relation to this project that Raisa was imaginative, brave and passionate about the rights and needs of children and young people in care. At the same time, she was meticulous in her planning of every aspect of the project. She knew that it was crucial to involve and respect the contribution of childcare staff if the project were to survive and to continue. She knew that the young people themselves had to be made welcome and to feel valued if they were to give of their best. She had the excellent idea of using people who had been in care themselves and who were mostly in their 20s and 30s as facilitators and catalysts in each group. A small army of support staff, secretaries, typists, social workers, photographers, filmmakers and editors worked willingly for her, becoming as passionate and interested in the needs of children in care as she was. The National Children's Bureau role was important for another reason too, as Raisa worked there with George Clark, who was the publications officer. He, a keen and talented amateur photographer himself, advised and mentored Raisa's early experiments with photography and even lent her his own camera at one point. He was also responsible for introducing Raisa to the skills required in printing her images herself something that she continued to do throughout her photographic career and which became a talent that she greatly valued and was highly skilled at. All this was happening at a time at which it is recalled that Raisa told a friend that she no longer trusted words, that only photographs could tell the truth. In any case, after a short period in which Raisa was taking more and more photographs in tandem with her social work career, in late 1978, she resigned from the National Children's Bureau and became a full-time photographer. As we look at some of the images she took during the next decade and a half, we must all be thankful that she did, but mindful of the part her first 46 years played in making her what she became, a truly first-class documentary photographer of great artistic and technical ability. 
The story of Raisa's extraordinary life and photographic career will get told in much greater detail in the fruits of the current research and writing project, which I'm lucky enough to be undertaking at the moment. Hopefully the resultant book and online material will assist in both contextualizing the outstanding photography she produced between the late 70s and early 90s, when she was forced to retire through ill health, and opening up her wonderful archive to current and future researchers of all kinds. That, that's wonderful, David. It's, it's really interesting to hear about those parts of her life that even as her a, a long-term friend of hers, I didn't know a lot of those details. Um, my name's Anita Corbin and I'm a photographer. And I would just like to talk a little bit about Raisa Page as a photographer. Um, I can imagine her starting her um, photography proper, if you like, when she was, when I spoke to Adrian Jones, she was working, she was spending quite a bit of time going down to the Greek islands, travel, driving down there with her in her Morris Minor, um, often with her daughter, Rachel, with her Zenith camera, um, which was quite heavy and, and cumbersome. But that would have been the, the start of her sort of foray into, into photography, creative photography and being able to capture images um, that, that told a story. The first time, my contact, first contact with Raisa Page was through her images of the uh, long-term hospital St. Lawrence's. And there was an exhibition on at the ICA um, that showed black and white portrait, black and white pictures of this um, social and mental health institution. And I was a young photographer, student photographer in my second year at the Polytechnic of Central London. I went to the exhibition and I was uh, really um, captured by these very uh, haunting images, black and white images in these long-term hospitals that Raisa had taken. And the pictures were um, usually all taken without being able to see the faces because of the security and um, not being wanting to show people in the situation. And I, I had this feeling that I needed to know more about the, the photographer because she had conveyed so much in these pictures, these, these graphic pictures um, without showing people's faces. So in fact, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was probably uh, only a few months after I had lost my own mother that year. And, and I guess I was looking for, um, she, she represented to me an older woman, an independent older woman that was a photographer. And she shared the passion for photography that I was sharing as, at my age, young age of 25. She was 50 and I was 25. Um, and um, behind every great photographer, I must say at this point, there is always a foundation, a bedrock. And Adrian Jones was, was Raisa Page's foundation bedrock. And she really did enable Raisa to, to go creatively into the world. Um, we finally got to meet, I finally got to meet Raisa when I, when I was invited to join um, Format, later known as Format Photographers, the first and only, still only, all women photographic agency. And that was in 1982. And I was, a, by that time, I was a first year student doing my uh, postgraduate at the Royal College of Art. And um, it's funny, but you know, when you, you meet someone and you just click with them, well, that happened. And talking to Adrian um, just before this, this here, I, she did say, I asked her, what were her first impressions of Raisa? And she said she was very earnest. She was very intelligent, but she was also exotic. And that is absolutely, I think she captured that feeling. I, I feel that too, that there was something very unusual about Raisa that you wanted to get to know her. And we had this shared love of photography, this shared passion to create images that, that told stories that you didn't need to read the captions of. Um, she was very determined to, well, both of us were very keen on top quality and high standards in, in image making. Um, and Raisa was especially very, diligent in the darkroom and she processed all her own films and printed all her own pictures and really she was a great all-rounder because she did the whole process right from the beginning to the end and 
there's not you know there's not many photographers that that can say they do that completely um she had this tenacity so even though she was uh, working on her own um, personal projects and often to do with people that weren't necessarily going to get seen in any other way so she was giving a face to these to these subjects that might be miss miss you know miss not seen i mean overlooked um, and she taught me to uh, look at our environment, look at our environment around us. You don't have to go to exotic places to take great photographs. Um, often it's right under your, your nose that you can see these stories, the domestic stories that need to be told. Um, and in, in, the, um, in the early 80s, 1982, 83, Greenham Common was, was really building um, and the protest there, the women's protest there. Uh, I mean, I went there a couple of times and there were always lots of press photographers there, but Raisa was so detailed and um, determined to capture every possible aspect of a story that she would go there and stay overnight sometimes. And the shot that she took, which is probably her most famous picture of the silos was taken after an, an all nighter. So she'd been up all night and, and the shot was taken in, I think the early hours of the New Year's Day in 1983, which then went on to become this huge embrace the base uh, protest, um, which went on for the day where the whole of the base was embraced by women holding hands. And that was, it was just, it was a very uh, emotional time, actually, the early 80s. Um, and then she went, she then became very interested in um, another great story, another great social story, which was the miners' strike, especially the women's side of the miners' strike. And she spent two or three years, uh, 80, 85, 86, again, looking at the domestic uh, stories around us and making some really powerful shots um, of, of the, the conflict. And she would spend a long time researching and getting to know people and making contact with people and returning to places. She really wanted to get absolutely everything she could get out of the stories. And she did do some traveling. She traveled to the States and did some great stories on, on women miners there working for the Observer and often taking pictures um, on spec almost and then giving the Observer the first look. So, you know, there was a fair amount of risk involved, but she was uh, determined. And um, so that, yes, yeah, so that's that's uh, one, of, one of the things that I think we, sh we shared was this sort of kind of absolute urge to take, to take the best possible images that we possibly could and to, to tell those stories that weren't gonna necessarily be told in, into the world. Um, she was incredibly good technically uh her sense of composition she she was you know she was very much about the form and the content working together so getting all the lighting getting the angles creating the right atmosphere being in the right place at the right time using the right lens um she you know she did she got to be very uh, natural at that and and very good at it and that's why the images are so to speak to us so clearly even now you know some of them are 40 years old and they still speak to us i mean the power of photography is incredible and you're seeing here just a small amount of of the pictures that raisa took and i do hope that you will go to the to the new collection online and really have a look at it and, and write comments about it and spend time studying each picture because there's so much in each picture, you can really unpack the pictures uh, and look at them and the details that Raisa has included uh, in a way that looks very natural and very spontaneous. Um, so we we got became really good friends, Raisa and, and Adrian and I, and uh, you know right up to to the end of her life, I could say that we did become family. And in some ways, um, I think you know they riser and adrian kind of filled the the gap that my my mother had left but also to a certain extent because her daughter rachel was away in canada quite a lot there was a little bit of of me filling that gap as well um so we we had some great weekends and as she came to towards the end of her career riser retired to the um to the area around abergavenny and found her little piece of paradise up there and I must say that she 
she did she did have a really fulfilled and complete life and had a lovely end to her life up there um, we did spend a lot of time together and just talking about photography and how important it was um, we did obviously uh, launched the format in 1983 format photographers and uh, rice has spent spent a lot of time uh, 20 years with with them and um, produced some brilliant images that are you know now available to for the world to see i'd just like to say that um i <coughs> excuse me <coughs> a big thank you <coughs> must go to Adrian, Adrian Jones, <coughs> excuse me, for being the catalyst to give us this wonderful resource to the world. <coughs> and Raisa would be so proud that these images and of, that she has given a face to these stories and that she would be absolutely tickle pink that she has been kept for the nation and kept forever in this wonderful archive. So I do hope you will really enjoy it and really use the resource. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you ever so much, both David and Anita for that uh, introduction to Raisa. For those of us who, who weren't, didn't have the, the pleasure of, of meeting her and knowing her, but we feel that we, we get to know her through her photographs and for the next, 20, 25 minutes, um, we're going to have a look at some of the, the photographs that have been selected by um, historians, by friends of Raisa, as well as um, archivists and, and, and some photographers as well. And I am just going to get up the... Uh, talking and um, getting up this the PowerPoint. Let me just get it up. There we go. So let's start having a look at some of the photographs that, that have been chosen. Um, we really would like you, the audience, to, to um, be part of the conversation. And please, please do put in some comments, ask questions in the chat function, and we will do our best to, um, to, to answer questions and look at uh, the comments. As we've already said, these photographs form the, the basis of the online exhibition that we are launching this evening and um, there will be links to all the photographs and the online exhibition appearing in the chat this evening. And please do take time to, uh, to have a look at the responses and, and add your own comments. So the first um, photograph that we're going to, to look at, or, or in Anita's word, unpack, um, is this photograph, Homeless Child in Temporary Accommodation. And David Johnston Smith actually selected this photograph. And he said of it, I've chosen this image by Raisa Page out of literally hundreds that I could have considered. What strikes me as crucial to its power is that it is so much more than simply being a well-framed, well-taken image of a subject in an appalling and unstable situation, although of course it is that as well. The horrible destitute shabbiness of the setting isn't hidden from us, far from it. One can almost smell the room, but there is so much more than just going on here. It is a dark and depressing image, certainly. No child should be living, however briefly, in such accommodation. But there is still a neatly made bed, despite the frayed bed cover. And the girl sit, sits politely with her hands together, almost formally, as she waits for the stranger with the camera to finish her work. I can read so many things from her face. A knowingness, perhaps. Cheekiness? Resignation? Possibly. 
but I can also see some hope in there, can't you? Please do write your responses in, in the chat function. We'd like to know what you think of this photograph, but Anita, David, you know, what can you see? I, th I think, I mean, I chose this picture partly and I could have chosen half of the collection, but I, I, I chose this um, picture partly because it follows on from a social work career. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is photograph, it's not explicit, but I think it's taken in Coventry um, in what was called licensed accommodation, uh, which was basically um, accommodation that had been declared unfit for, for human um, habitation, which um, the councils were allowed to license to homeless people um, before they were hopefully rehoused. And obviously you can see some of the, some of the degradation there. Um, but I, I mean, personally, I think there's just a, you know, a humanity going on there between the photographer and the subject that is uh, sort of empathy and humanity that is, um, is very powerful. Yeah, there's some great comments in the chat. The, the, the absence that strikes me, um, Lisa has said, no toys, no bedside, no lamp, no bedside lamp, no siblings, no friends. Yeah, it's, um, it's as a photographer, you, you, you know, you, you see these when you're doing a documentary style photography, you see this and it's, it's almost as though it could not be more perfect to tell the story. Um, I mean, I'm sure, I don't know whether Raisa would have put her into that situation. She may have asked her to sit on the bed, um, but it doesn't really matter. It's the connection between her, the child and the photographer and the pride that she's, you know, showing that she has a pride in her situation. Um, that's what you always want to do as a photographer is to make people feel, you know, that they're empowered by your picture almost. Um, Thank you. Let's move on to the next photograph, which um, was chosen by Dr. Sarah May, a lecturer at Swansea University. And um, Sarah's response to this photograph was looking at this image, the thing that pops for me is the graffiti. It's why I chose it. Sometimes viewed as a problem by heritage professionals, graffiti has been a window onto resistance for at least 2000 years. In this case, the writing is a chance to talk back to approved redevelopment and as such chimes with the views of many heritage professionals through perhaps for different, though perhaps for different reasons. In 1979, when this picture was taken, archaeologists often viewed themselves as rescuing the past from the bulldozers. This was seen as a service to a wider community, perhaps even the people who wrote this graffiti. For Raisa Page, the two boys are not incidental. They are the centre of her interest. They're alive, engaging with her, clowning, their faces smiling, but not easy or open, call to mind many children I have met from myself from Shank Hill, later than this photo, but before the peace process. These two boys need plenty of things, especially peace and a stable future. Her framing of them with the graffiti and their posing in front ventriloquized ventriloquizes them, makes the viewer imagine that the boys are the authors. Of course, they may have painted it, they may have agreed with it, or they may simply have been passing when Paige arrived. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think they were posing? Were they passing? It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, there's definitely an interaction there again, which is, is is so present in so many of Rice's images. Um, I, I too love the um, uh, love the graffiti. Um, there's some other graffiti images I can think of. Um, uh, sort of yuppies out across a bridge in in North London. I think is, is one image that springs to mind. But um, yeah, always always interested in that. And I think this area is now um, the motorway in. Um, in 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 Belfast, um, I think that's I think I'm right in saying that. Um, yeah, 
it's, it's a I think, great one. Yeah, she, it shows that, that, you know, that she's having a chat with them. She's talk, she's she's out in the street and she's probably framed up that shot, I would say, because obviously it's very accurate, the framing on that shot with the whole of the graffiti taking the big part of the picture. Um, and I would imagine that they were just larking about in the street and maybe she, you know, asked them to get in the picture or they were already there and she just interacted with them. Um, it doesn't feel at all forced or, or no. sort of posed, does it? No. Let's move on to our next um, image, which is um, this image from West Belfast, which was uh, chosen by photographer Edward Thompson, who, who says of this photograph, Looking at Paige's photograph, it's clear to see how of the time this photograph was. This is an emotionally cold photograph. Even the child looking into the camera is wrapped in a scarf and woolly hat. It's a confusing photograph. What are we looking at? Is it a glimpse through some broke, broken fence into a nightmarish labyrinth? Why is the soldier waving his arm like that? It's an odd gesture. The boy in the foreground looks like he's swearing at the camera, or maybe he's picking his nose, or maybe both. It's hard to tell at this resolution. There are flashes of meaning here, but nothing we can really deduce a single narrative from. Instead, it's a jarring image of great physical depth. The composition leads you down and down through various planes, starting with the boy in the foreground, then the fence, then the alley, then the side of the building with the gold drawn on it, further down still another alley, and finally a wall. It draws you in and there lies its beauty and its horror. Great description. It is a great description. Yes, you it, you you follow it, don't you? Down the alley, down see to the wall, and uh, see the goalposts. Yeah, yeah, and that wet sort of just rained feeling on the pavement. It's all got that very sinister feel to it, definitely. Yeah, is yeah. Is the dog a guard dog? Is what's a dog doing there? Is a dog with the child? Or? Absolutely. <laughs> I don't think the uh, soldier wasn't too keen on being photographed, I, I gather. He, he's, <laughs> you know, he looks like he's shooing, definitely shooing, shooing rice or away. Yeah. <laughs> could, could I just say one thing briefly while we're here? Uh, there was a comment on the, on the chat about um, could you move the box so we could see the image? Um, you, you yourself, the users, can actually move the box wherever you want it on the screen. So if you just put your put your cursor over it and move it across when when the picture's on the right or whatever, um, you can move it round so you can see it. Yeah, yeah that, that thing, the juxtaposition of the toddler and the child, of the soldier and the child, is is very powerful. And the composition, the, you know, the golden section coming into play in every possible way it could. Um, brilliantly printed, I must say because it would have been a pretty dreary day by the looks of it. So that was, she printed that one herself, you can tell, you know, she printed very, very well. Okay. You mentioned yeah, the dog, the dog looks like a wolf. Yeah, someone <laughs> saying that, yeah, the dog looks like a wolf. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you for, for sharing all your, your comments and we, you know, we will pick up on any that we haven't got time to um, later on um, after the event. We will we'll add some comments to the website. We mentioned see, um, sorry, I, I was just going to say I can see some of um, Raisa's other colleagues um, making comments there. I can see Maggie Murray is um, in the audience. So hello to Maggie. Hello to Maggie. In my view, I'm unable to see all the chat. So um, Anita and David, you know, please do yeah. pick up on any um, any messages that are coming forward. Um, next photograph we mentioned about Raisa um, traveling over to the US and taking photographs of, of women minors. And Adrian has actually selected this uh, 
image which uh, was on the, the front page of the Observer magazine. And uh, Adrian says that this image from 1980 accompanied a story by Anthea Disney in the Observer. It was taken on the first of several visits by Raisa to meet and photograph women coal miners in Virginia and Utah. Some of them later visited Raisa in London, a mark of the connection she developed with them. Raisa related to them as human beings, not as objects to be photographed, and they shared many things about their lives. Raisa admired their determination to use their voice and open up communication and their personal and collective courage. The miners had the support of the Coal Employment Project, which was set up in 1977, four years after the first woman was hired as a miner in the US to help women gain employment in the industry. The Coal Employment Project itself ended in 1996, and Cosby Ann Totten, who is um, the lady on the left of the photo, was its director by then. She'd been a coal miner for six years and was laid off in 1982. She'd spoken of the many challenges of working in the mine. She was driven to the work to earn a better wage and enable her as a single parent to support her six children. There was a pervading superstition that a woman entering a mine was considered bad luck. The work is dangerous and dirty, but it gets into your blood, she said. A very powerful image. There's a great, sorry, I was just going to say there's a great point from Mark in the chat, uh, Mark Roke, who says a technically brilliant image, considering the lamp is direct onto the lens, the absence of flare is something that would have been challenging to remove in the dark room. Yeah, I think. very true. And very, and Raisa was incredibly proud of this picture. Because, you know, being on the cover of the Observer was mm. big kudos. Mm. She actually talks in the um, British Library oral history um, uh, conversations that she had in 94 with Michael Ann Mullen. Um, she actually talks of being smuggled into the colliery wa uh, washroom at midnight um, because she was actually, um, the management wouldn't allow her in. They, they actually relented in the end and did let her, let her in, but there's, there's photographs from both. There's photographs when she got smuggled in and also, I'm not quite sure which, which side of the divide this was, but... Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the colour is, uh, is outstanding, the use of colour, like, beautiful colour. And, and Maggie's saying on the chat, Maggie Murray is saying on the chat that the, uh, the women miners story was one reason that we approached Raisa to join the discussions about setting up format. So um, clearly a, 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 an important image in her, in her photographic career. Yeah. Moving on to the next image, still in the, in the US, and this um, this photograph, which Anita you you selected, um, which is and you said of this, this picture is of a woman farmer. Well, we presume that she's a woman farmer. She's sitting hand milking her cow in the middle of the picture. The first thing you really focus on is the straightness of her back. She has worked the land for many years. She's part of the landscape. This literally highlights one of the backbone themes in Raisa's work. In this everyday activity, she's showing us the strength of women. We are the backbone of society. The farmer is looking to the ground. Her back is strong and her pose is solid. Her profile set off against the cow's haunch. Was she sad that she was taking the milk meant for the calf? A little maybe. If you look at the picture long enough, you will see so much universal messaging going on there. Even though it was taken 40 years ago, it could have been 140 years ago. It's timeless. And I think it's also one of, uh, it's quite an unusual photograph for Raisa, isn't it? Yes, that's why I, I selected it because it's not the, not the ones that you would expect. And she had this softness, real softness to her, the side of her that was, really about creating you know images of, of humanity and and I do feel that this picture is it could be it is a picture about life and um, just the way that the, the cow and the composition again it, is, is the cow have you know is she in pain is she feeling relieved um, is about balance life is a balance sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad and sometimes it's balanced 
And I just think it, for me, that's what it says as a photographer. I just love it. I'd love a big print of it, actually. <laughs> me too. Me too. Moving on to um, the next photograph, which is has been chosen by um, Professor David Turner from Swansea University. And um, this photograph, he, he says, early morning, an aimless walk in the grounds of the hospital and this dates from 1981 this photograph and David says Rice's page it's a photograph of patients taking exercise in the grounds of St Lawrence's Hospital in Catterham Surrey is a melancholy depiction of life inside a long stay institution for people with learning disabilities the monochrome image shows several figures with their backs to the viewer a passageway with an austere building on one side and a wire fence on the other, and one of them, a, man, a young man in a wheelchair. This atmospheric photograph invokes isolation and loneliness. Although there are several figures in the picture, there's no interaction between them. Each seems in a world of their own. Very powerful photograph. Yeah, the, the descript there's the, in the chat it's saying the description is heartbreaking. It feels mm. shocking that the photograph is from 1980. It could be Victorian. Yeah, that's yeah. true. I think that's why Raisa was so keen to show these these situations in the institutions because it, you know you just can't believe it really. I mean, I remember when I saw this picture in the exhibition when I first heard about Raisa that I was just like, how can this be? You know, 1979 or 80. Mm. How can we still have this Victorian style of care? Indeed. Indeed. Hugely powerful images and, and um, also a lot of them, I mean, there are quite a number from, I think, two or three um, trips from sort of 78, 79 up to sort of 81. Eight, uh, and, um, you know, they, they, they're a challenge, certainly in this day and age, they're a, they're a challenge to use as well to to you know how they can be how, mm -hmm. how they can be can be seen and, and portrayed and used in you know if i wanted to in in exhibitions and things because obviously you know changed. yeah so i mean you know there would have been no permissions granted or anything like that in that in, in, in at that time so yeah um mm -hmm. quite a lot of them do have the backs i think you pointed that out yeah. and to, yeah. you know people from the back but you know there are also a lot of faces as well from people that could still well be alive so mm. uh, we have to be very aware of that when we uh, uh, so how, how we use them good comments on the chat again fantastic composition an ageless image um and there's somebody here jenny war saying as an archivist in surrey in the 1990s i was going into these institutions to salvage their documents yeah. oh fantastic yeah, yeah. So that's a great contact there it is it is the next few photographs that we're going to have a look at are um, from Greenham, from Greenham Common. And uh, I think, you know, as has been said previously, I think Raisa is well known for her, the photographs that she took while there. The first um, photograph that we are going to look at was um, chosen by uh, Chris Hill from the University of South Wales. And he says, this photograph taken by Raisa Page on the 12th of December, 1982, captures the builds up to an effort by um, 1,500 women to blockade the base, also depicted in Page's photographic archive. The blockade was highly conducive to media representation, provoking a range of gendered hues and symbols. In the photograph, a group of and as yet unidentified women stand in front of a protest and survive banner, itself a satirical rebuttal of Thatcher's government protect and survive civil defense program. The banner depicts a pair of Picasso doves circling around a nuclear holocaust, a representation perhaps of the role of the women in surrounding the base at Greenham Common. The women in the photograph cross generations, their age, dress, and styles providing an indication of how the protest might intersect with the strands of feminism and identity politics. 
I'll go on to the next photograph as well um, of pensioners at Greenham, and then we can perhaps talk about both together. And this photograph was um, chosen by Christoph Laft at, from Swansea University, who, um, who mentions, of course, the elderly couple who are protesting against the sighting of an American intermediate range um, nuclear weapons just outside the perim perimeter fence of RAF Greenham Common. They appear to wear their Sunday best. She sits on a camping chair with her purse on her knees, holding an umbrella in her hand. He stands next to her. Next to them, a handwritten banner attached to the perimeter fence reads, yes, we are old enough to know better. This is the remarkable scene that photographer Raisa Page captured during one of her visits to the Women's Peace Camp at Greenham Common. Pensioners demonstrating at the Women's Peace Camp in the early 1980s. That is certainly not a scene that many would commonly associate with the anti-nuclear weapons protests at one of the most iconic peace camps in the 20th century history. But it is one of the many hidden gems in the Raisa Page collection that enable us to view post-war social protest and activism in a completely new light. And I think, you know, that's very, very true. And yeah. with the online exhibition, you know, we, we hope to make more of these photographs available in, in due course. There's a comment in the chat about from um, Rose Debenham, whose the PhD thesis has um, been able to be informed by the collection. So she's very, yeah, she's saying that she was lucky enough to gain access. So that's really cool that, that you know, that, that these stories are being written about. And again, Raisa would be absolutely over the moon with this, mm -hmm. being able to, the stories to be told again and again and again. I think I, re I mean, I didn't go to Greenham as much as Raisa, but I do remember this couple there. And that was one of the brilliant things about Greenham is that it was, a protest, yes, but there was all ages, all walks of life were there. Children, you know, across the board. It was just a place where you just felt you had to go and see what was, see what, what you know, people power. Yeah, good. I'm conscious of time, so we will canter through the next, but we've got three more photographs left to, to view. <laughs> Again, this, the next photograph, this one has been chosen by uh, Katrina Legg from the Richard Burton archives, our colleague. And um, this is a derelict youth club in Toxteth in the 1980s. And uh, Katrina reflects on the haunting beauty and curiosity in the photograph of dereliction, the broken glass of what once must have been an impressive window, the subterranean world boarded up. The photograph places the building both below and above, but the focus is on a very small part of what was an impressive edifice in Toxteth, Liverpool, the sign, Stanley House Youth Club. The photograph has the agency description, Inner Cities, UK, L Liverpool, derelict youth club, Toxteth, and was taken sometime in the 80s. The photograph makes me want to explore the building climb down into the basement, look out of the windows and find out what happened there. Who ran the youth club? Who went there? What were their experiences? Perhaps this is a sad photograph that captures the end of a building and all it offered, but perhaps it shows the determination of people to help one another, to give people, to give young people something to participate in and create a better place. Raisa work usually, Raisa's work usually includes people they're just shadows and memories in this photograph. Again, another very powerful, powerful photograph. And it does, it makes you want to, to crawl into it, doesn't it? And there's a great comment that where are these youth now? Mm. Yeah, where are they? Yeah. The final two photos that we have date from the 1984-85 miners' strike. This one, which was um, selected by um, Leighton James um, from Swansea University, and he notes the um, the miners' food fund labels on the collection tins in the photograph speak to the very real hardships that strikers and their families faced during the strike. 
Yet the fancy dress of the women demonstrates that even during these difficult times, there was a, a place for humor and playfulness. And every time I look at this photograph, seeing the lady peering through the window, just, just cracks me up. <laughs> How most many of spotted her. <laughs> Um, most of, I mean, most of Rice's um, uh, minor strike images are from South Yorkshire. So mm -hmm. I think there's only one trip. Were, were you with Anita? Were, did you, were you with? I might, I can't remember if I was with this, on this trip. I did do one trip with her to Wales um, in the early days of the minor strike. And okay. uh, yeah, it was, it was, you know, she was making contacts and networking and then going to go back and because this is soon after it started, so um, yeah, yeah. yeah, could have could have been. Could have been then, yeah. I vaguely remember it. Yeah, I know we drove quite late into the night home. So <laughs> the final image that we we have got again is from the the miners' strike, and this one was was chosen by Sue Thomas, um, who's uh, recently retired from the Richard Burton archives. And she says um, about this, that what struck her with this image was the women united in the organized political arena of the conference fighting their cause. Raisa captures the moment from the sidelines and it feels like the women are not aware of the photograph being taken. The sense of unity and empowerment the women demonstrate is captured and it's almost possible to hear their voices. Who were these women? What are their stories? Looking back now, what lens would they view their experience through? And that would have been technically a difficult shot to take actually, mm -hmm. because um, dark and it's, she's using flash, um, but it's, it's um, yeah, she it would have been a difficult mm -hmm. shot for her to take with the movement as well. And uh, it's lovely, just all the different clothing styles. I love all the different, <laughs> You know, 1985 was quite a transformation of, of styles. So we have, we're almost out of time, but before we finish, you know, what we would like to do is to invite you, the audience, to um, select the photograph that really stood out for you. So we have another poll and we would like you to participate. There we are. Please take your pick which photograph from the online exhibition stood out. Choose uh, one, two, eleven. Just need to scroll down on the right yeah. if you want to get down to the bottom. Yeah. What is it going to be? The suspense. Oh, well, we get to know. <laughs> we will, we will. I think uh, we will find out very, very shortly. <laughs> That's true, don't want to pick one because they're all brilliant, yes. <laughs> 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 you have to select two, oh, okay. Okay. Two votes, two votes. Oh. Okay. Two votes, yeah. Ah. Ah, the results are in. And. Got a tie, I think. Three and 11. Troops and Ah. Interesting. Yeah. Do we have the music from 11? We, it will be, it's um, the music will be on the online exhibition. Okay, because it's a really, it's a really, if anybody's interested, it's a really powerful song. It's um, sometimes called We Are Women, We Are Strong. It's by um, Mal Finch, who was in a collective called Flaming Nerve um, and really adopted by uh, the, the uh, miners, miners' wives um, kind of groups, um, particularly in South Yorkshire, um, Betty Cook and, uh, Anne Scargill were, were been singing it on on local news, promoting their recent books. So um, it's a really powerful song. Yeah, and you can we we will have a link to it from from the online exhibition. 
we've talked about this evening um, one of Rice's most famous photographs and um, I don't know why it's not there we are we have a, one final poll before we finish this photograph Greenham dancing on the silos at dawn we we just our final question is did you know that Raisa Page was the creator of this photograph so you have another chance to vote the poll will appear shortly here we are And while you're doing that, just another, another reminder, please don't forget to, to visit the online exhibition. The, the links will be in the chat and you can follow them as well from the, the Being Human um, pages and also from the, the Richard Burton archive pages. Um, and again, while we're waiting, I would just like to, oh, here we are, we have the results. The results are in and, and most people didn't know, 58% didn't know that Raisa was the creator of this photograph. One of, well, her best, her, probably her most well-known photo. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, moment in history. Yeah, indefinitely. I would like to um, just finish by by saying thank you to, to you all, the audience, for being so fantastic and, and contributing and um, leaving so many comments. Those comments and questions that we haven't had time to, to look at or deal with, we will, um, we will find a way of responding to you and we will put responses up on the online exhibition. Please do look at the online exhibition. Please do make comments. We want to engage uh, with you. Obviously, I want to say a big, big thank you to Anita and to David for, for your contribution, to Adrian um, and my colleagues in the Richard Burton archives, particularly Stacey and Katrina, for all their hard work on the exhibition and supporting this event, to Elaine and Matt, who've done an excellent job in organising and coordinating the Being Human events at Swansea, and to Cinema and Co as well for their partnership. And finally, another big thanks to, to everybody that has joined this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it. You know, please do fill in the survey. Let us have your feedback and, um, and do, um, do get in touch with us at the Richard Burton Archives as we make this quite remarkable collection more available. And just Thank just you. one, can I just mention the Twitter page as well? Of course, yes. yes. The tw there's a, a Twitter page as well as the... Um, uh, Richard Burton Archives Twitter, there is a, a dedicated Twitter page, um, at Raisa page, um, which uh, please do follow because that will have um, all sorts of, well, it's got lots of images on it as well, um, but it also will have uh, details about, uh, about the forthcoming book and, uh, and, and everything else as well. Good, and if I actually go on to the last... Can I just say a big thank you from Raisa? <laughs> she would be absolutely so delighted with it, with all this and everything that you're doing uh, as a photographer it's, you know you just you just live in hope that something like this happens to your work so <laughs> it's brilliant well it's our we're delighted we're delighted and well, thank you thank you everybody and uh, have a good rest of evening